Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. And now, the Rock Newman Show. Folks, welcome back. November the 2nd, 2013, we're broadcasting live from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Poets, 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. Um, I like to say that. I like to say that I'm in the Langston Hughes Room. I'm happy to be where I am, happy to do, be doing this broadcast from this location. It is a facility that welcomes all. Uh, this particular facility, frankly speaking, uh, this restaurant embraces all from every spectrum of life and welcomes you and you certainly are welcome to come down and to join the show get some great breakfast here on a saturday morning and any other morning uh, all day long the service the food and everything else is just great the atmosphere the climate the fact that they promote bus boys and poets uh, bus boys and poets promotes that there is one tribe, there's one world, that we're all trying to work towards making the world a little better place to live. My guest in this second hour is DC, the chairman of the D.C. City Council, Phil Mendelson. Phil, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you got a lot of stuff going on today, but thanks for dropping by. Glad to be here. Thank you for being here. Phil, let's just jump right in here. Um, we've got, we have a mayoral race Yes. Coming up in 2014 and on live television, things happen. We just had something happen back there, but we're going to keep on going. <laughs> um, the, um, we, we have a race coming up. Yes. And there is a question as to whether or not the current mayor, conventional wisdom says uh, that the current mayor, while he has been in office, Mayor Gray, has done quite a good job, that the city has moved ahead, that there's been a lot of progress, um, that uh, on his watch, given, I'm saying conventional wisdom, yeah. given the job that he's done, he would deserve a second term. There is a big question about whether or not he's going to run. You who work so closely with the mayor as the chairperson of the city council, what is your opinion about whether or not Mayor Gray should run or not run? Well, I can only guess what he's going to do, and we're going to find out in a week because the petitions, the petitioning, which every candidate has to do to get on the ballot, begins next Friday, November 8th. My guess is that he's going to run um, because he's been acting like he's going to run, and um, he does have a record that he can point to. The... Um, uh, you know, I think about where we are economically. Yeah. The, the city is so much better off today than it was just a few, a couple of years ago. Financially, we were able to weather the federal shutdown, which we never could have done before because we've built up the reserves. Just as a, for example, uh, we've begun to get out of the um, a number of the receiverships, the court receiverships, which uh, when Mayor Fenty was the mayor, he talked about trying to do. When Tony Williams was the mayor, he talked about trying to do. We've actually gotten out of some of them. We've reduced some of the costs of special education. These are just examples. Uh -huh. uh, in the area of criminal justice, the city is doing much better. I know that area particularly well because I chaired the council's judiciary. Committee. So how are we doing much better in the criminal justice? I mean, we're going to go back to some of the other things you said, but uh, just on that particular well, point. Well, the trend, the long-term trend has been a substantial decline in homicide robberies and other violent crimes mm -hmm. and in fact the long-term trend and when I say long-term I'm talking about the, if you look back the last five six years we've seen the number of violent crimes in which a gun has been used to go down even greater than the reduction in violent crime um, people are very pleased with Kathy Lanier uh, we just opened a year ago a consolidated forensic lab which is state-of-the-art in terms of forensic evidence you know nobody can do as well as CSI does on TV <laughs> but we have a state of the art lab that's doing, you know, is, is competing with CSI. Uh, these are all positive steps in terms of uh, public safety. The lab, you know, was an initiative that began under Tony Williams. It's hard to believe how long it's taken to get it open. Uh, the police, uh, two months ago, dedicated the Tactical Village, which surrounding law enforcement agencies are, are want to use. This is for training, mm -hmm. for all kinds of... Um, um, you know, like a mass, ca not mass casualty, but an active shooter incident, for example. Um, and it, just in different ways, we've um, 
uh, improve uh, public safety in the city? You know, I, I've had guests on. Uh, Kathy Lanier has yes. been on, and certainly she is, she cuts an imposing and, and impressive figure. Yes. Um, I think that you know you look around the uh, country and you look at police chiefs, and Kathy Lanier has to be thought of as to be one of the best mm -hmm. in, in the country. Talk to her a little bit about this, and I also talk to someone from the lawyers group that have talked about the disproportionate number of arrests of those in the African-American community. This, this, this city now is, uh, is, is, is more, is less than 50% African-American. And it was staggering numbers, for example, yes. of those arrested on a misdemeanor sort of drug charges were African-American. What is happening with that? Why is that? And how do we, how do we correct that? Well, it is a concern, and it's a concern on the misdemeanor side, not the felony side. I mean, there's, there are no charges that I know of that the police are policing um, disproportionately African Americans or people of color uh, with regard to robberies or murders. I, I don't hear that complaint. Uh, but I, I do hear it with regard to the misdemeanors and particularly the drug offenses. I think part of the issue is we need to look at whether some of those should be offenses. Uh, for instance, uh, marijuana, and you know, marijuana is, uh, there are a couple of bills pending in the council, one of which would decriminalize it. Uh, are you supporting the decriminalization? Yes. My, my only hesitation is, uh, and I do have some hesitation, is that we have to be mindful that as the nation's capital, an issue like that in which Congress has intervened in the past, that we don't want to go too far and have Congress step in. Now, that's not a reason to abandon the policy. It's just a matter of coming, a reason for coming up with the right strategy to get it into effect. But, you know, the effective treatment of substance abuse is not putting somebody in jail. It just yeah. isn't. Yes. And yet that's what we do with these misdemeanors is that uh, they're, they're all criminal offenses in which there's jail time associated. And we've seen across the country an increasing number of jurisdictions that uh, look at marijuana and say, this is not an offense that should be arrestable. Right, right, right. Um, let, let's go back. Uh, the, man, there was quite the controversy um, roughly three weeks, month or so ago about the living wage yes. bill in, yes. in Washington, D.C. Uh, the mayor vetoed what, yes. the, what he was sent by the council. Where did you stand on that? Oh, well, I had authored the legislation, and uh, I was solidly behind the legislation, and I was disappointed in the mayor's veto, and I was disappointed that we went from eight votes, which was one short of being able to override the veto, to seven votes, with one council member changing her vote. Um, but... You know, one looks for a silver lining, and I, I sort of hate it when one, people talk this way, but the reality is that a majority of the council has said that they want to see uh, an increase in the minimum wage. The, a number of those who oppose the living wage bill, the living wage bill, have said they support a minimum wage, and I think we are on the brink of passing an increase, a substantial increase in the minimum wage. Substantial increase, what's that going to look like? Well, 11.50 in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, the minimum wage in the district is 825, and uh, there's no jurisdiction in the country that's at 1150 right now. Uh, we would get there over three years. Uh, right now, San Francisco is at 1055. Uh, uh, Santa Fe is at 1050, if I remember correctly. We would go to 1025 in 2015, and then 2016 go to 1150. And, and that falls short of what the living wage is calculated to be to, to survive in a district. But it would be a substantial increase. I'm told that we have the highest cost of living of any city in the country. And, uh, and therefore, I, I think we should embrace that our minimum wage needs to go up. And, and there's nothing wrong with it being the highest in the country, although it wouldn't be that much higher mm. than other jurisdictions. You know what? Um, it is, that seems so practical. Yeah. Politicians don't necessarily have a great reputation for doing what is yes. practical. You, so you're going to push hard for that. Yes, and, and I think the votes are there. Um, I, I think How does the, the business community feel about that? Well, the business community, what they have said is that they support an increase in the minimum wage. And I think that's also a byproduct of the living wage, the large retailer accountability act fight, that uh, you know, their argument against uh, that bill, which people saw as the Walmart bill, but it was more than Walmart. Their argument against it was, you shouldn't just focus on a couple of businesses. You should do something broad. Well, we're doing something broad. The business community has said they support an increase in the minimum wage. 
they say reasonable. What does reasonable mean to them? Well, they know that we're looking at 1150, and um, while I, I can't say that they've embraced that, the opposition to it is, um, I've not sensed as being significant. Not so as I'm optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Where they're really upset is over a proposal to increase what's called the tipped minimum wage for tipped workers, and um, that gets very complicated. Yeah. But So let me ask you, um, the mayor vetoed the bill. Yes. Which seems to have opened the door for Walmart to come into the city yes. with its major developments, opening up, opening up its mega stores and creating a lot of jobs. Yes, four or five stores. Okay. Now, that's good or bad for Washington, D.C.? Well, you know, I, to, to me, the reason why I'm hesitating is uh, you know, opening stores is good. That, that kind of economic activity is good. On the other hand, uh, we need decent weight, uh, decent jobs, not just jobs. And, and that's what gets, gets lost in this. People are excited about another business that opens up with paying minimum wage jobs. You can't live in the District of Columbia on $8.25 an hour. You can't. Mm -hmm. And the living wage, according to MIT, and anybody can go on MIT.edu, um, and you can look up Washington, D.C., the living wage... For a single person, is thirteen dollars and sixty-eight cents an hour. At eight twenty-five, we're not close, and I'm not even sure thirteen sixty-eight is uh, good enough. Uh, certainly, if you have a child, a single adult with a child, you need more than thirteen dollars and sixty-eight. In fact, I think the minute, the living wage there is over twenty dollars an hour. So, you know, op opening stores with jobs that are minimum wage sounds good creating more jobs, but these are jobs people can't live on. That's a very tough issue, huh? Correct. Correct. Because, and, and I, because I mean, it's not just the long term is a Walmart coming in and having jobs. They're making gazillions of dollars of profit, and people who are working for them don't have a living wage. That's one thing. Yes. The, 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 and the other side is... In order to build a Walmart, you got a whole bunch of construction jobs that's going on. You know, you are spurring economic, the argument from that other side was, for example, Skyland. Yeah. You know, if Walmart anchors that project and you have a whole development over there, and if they don't, it may sit in blight as it has for yes. another 20 years. It's not an easy, not an easy issue to grapple with. Oh, absolutely, it's not an easy answer. But I think that the the answer is a long-term strategy, a, a vision, and the vision is quality jobs in the district. Um, so I, I don't think the, the the best economic strategy for Washington D.C. is to pursue minimum wage jobs. It's to pursue. Um, um, economic growth that pays better wages than minimum wage. Mm -hmm. uh, or to put it more simply, I would not have as the, the key to my economic development strategy attracting Walmart stores. I would have as the key attracting uh, higher end, I shouldn't say higher end stores, but better paying jobs. Better paying jobs. For instance, in the tech sector or in the healthcare industry. Uh, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about necessarily, I'm not talking about doctors, I'm talking about uh, technicians, for example. People who get paid more than minimum wage. You said something early on. Um, you said that you, your guess, you certainly didn't bet the House, but you said your yeah. guess is that Mayor Gray will run for a second term. You are an astute politician. Well, okay. That, that Some people might find that debatable, but, you know, you're kind of the quiet man that keeps on winning. Yes. Um, that's your feeling that he's going to run. Why do you feel that way? Uh, you know, I've worked with Vince since he was first elected to the council in 2004. I used to sit next to him before he became chairman of the council. Uh, we've always had a good working relationship, and um, I think, uh, you know, just as I know him, that uh, what I see is a person who's going to run, not a person who's um, looking to close out his term and his being mayor. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a guess. Yeah. And, and again, track record in office seems to say that it would deserve four more years. There is a climate, an unfortunate climate, a cloud that I think hangs over D.C. politics. Unquestionably. Former chairman convicted of wrongdoing while in office. Harry Thomas 
convicted. Michael Brown, I think, has now has, yes. has, has, has pled guilty. Other folks having taken money from the businessman who is at the center of the investigation into the mayor's previous campaign. So, you know, this particular program is about exporting the incredibly wonderful culture and all the good and great things about Washington, D.C. to the rest of the world. We have an agenda. You know, I don't come here pretending that we don't. We do. We have an agenda. We want to expose the rest of the world to Washington, D.C. We consume here as 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 uh, as live streaming viewers, as radio listeners, as TV viewers. We consume products really that comes from everywhere else in the world. This is about sending out Washington, D.C. Yeah. to the rest of the world. But we've got to be real and that there is a there is that cloud. So in that cloud, you've got Muriel Bowser that is running. Yeah. You've got Jack Evans that is running. You've got Tommy Wells that is running, who are all member, who's members of the D.C. Council, which you chair. Why didn't you run? Why don't I run? I said, why didn't you? Why didn't I? Why, why did you choose not to uh, run? Well, I enjoy very much the legislative process, and I think there's a skill to um, being successful in the legislative process. Uh, I became chairman a year ago, and uh, I, um, I enjoy being the chairman, and uh, I think that my skills as chairman will grow, and uh, so I'm, I'm content where I am. So would that mean you have no aspirations to well, be mayor at any point? In politics, one never says no. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am um, next Friday, November 8th, going to take out petitions to run for re-election as chairman of the council. Okay. I want to deal with that in a term, from a timing point of view uh, about uh, the mayor and when he needs to pick up his petitions, sure. that sort of thing. When we come back, take okay. a break. Come back with D.C. City Council Chairperson Phil Mendelson, the quiet, effective man. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Folks, welcome back. Today, November the 2nd, 
Saturday, 2013. My guest in studio at Bus Boys and Ports in the Langston Hughes Room, City Council DC Chairman, uh, DC City Council Chairman Phil Mendelson. Phil, I'd like for you to give us a little education on a couple of things. Sure. Uh, when we went to break, you were talking about the time that you, you think we're going to have a decision by the mayor yes. in a week or so. Now, you mentioned the date of November the 8th. I remember reading in the newspaper from the Washington Post, Mike DeBonis' article, where he talked about for certain that the mayor would make a decision by then. It sounded as if anybody running for office had to do something by the 8th. Is that the case? Pretty much. I mean, it's not a hard and fast deadline. Uh -huh. But the reality is that... In order to run for office, citywide office, in a party primary, like the mayor running for uh, in the Democratic primary, yes. he has to get 2,000 signatures. And you know, to be safe, you always get at least twice that number. So 4,000 signatures between November 8th and January 2nd. It's a horrible time to be collecting signatures uh -huh. because of Thanksgiving and the, the December holidays. And uh, so there's there's less time in, in, than in previous years. A, a candidate. So that's not a hard and fast rule, but it makes a whole lot of sense to get them sooner than later. Yeah, I right. mean, if if I don't get my my 2,000 signatures in the month of November, I'm going to be knocking on your door on on Christmas Eve. I, I don't know if you're going to answer the door when you're sitting down for Christmas dinner, and I'm there saying, "Will you sign my petition?" So I got to do those signatures in November. If I don't start on November 8th then I'm just making life more difficult. Mm -hmm. but that's why I think November 8th is when we're going to see candidates coming forward. That's very interesting. On November the 9th, sitting at this very table, Vince Gray will be my guest. Okay. So uh, that's some pretty good timing for us here. Yes, and if he hasn't taken out the petitions on Friday, I ask him why. Uh, he, I mean, he, he, he just can't wait. So he'll have to do it Monday, if not Friday, but he just can't wait. Okay. That's true for all of us. What's your thought as a studied politician as to you think he's going to run knowing him? So many people are weighing uh, just recently, you know, once again, the Washington Post has been pretty relentless about the mayor yeah. speaking out about the previous campaign, what he knew, when he knew it. And that sort of thing. For the most part, on advice of counsel, the mayor said, I'm not answering those questions. With that as a, how do you figure, as a, again, as a politician, that affects his campaign? There's no question it does affect the campaign. And it's a horrible situation to be in. Uh, on the one hand, uh, he has to deal with what's going on with the U.S. Attorney's investigation, and he certainly doesn't want to say something that is inaccurate, um, that invites inv more investigation that's inaccurate or, you know, whatever. He's got to be very careful in that regard, very careful in that regard, mm -hmm. uh, because there, there's a U.S. Attorney involved. And sure. on the other hand, in politics, uh, the public has a right to know what happened and to demand to know what happens. Mm -hmm. So one has to be quiet and one has to be verbose. And yeah. how you reconcile the two is, is a horrible dilemma. And, and voters have a right to uh, understand what happened in 2010. And clearly there was wrongdoing that happened because we've seen a number of people who've already pled guilty uh, with regard to the 2010 mayoral campaign. Uh, so it, it's a very difficult situation. I, I don't know how going to reconcile those two um, needs, but he's going to have to. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you about your governing style yeah. and your campaigning style. Sure. One of your opponents in the last race for uh, city council would go to, according to him, he would go and knock on doors and he would hold up your picture. Yes. And he would say, do you know who this man is? And they said no. And they said no. Yes. And you, get, you won by a landslide. Yes. Tell me about that magic. Well, you know, this is a challenge of, uh, with regard to, to democracy in this country. And that is the, the voters are, don't participate as much as they need to. The reality is that most of the people on the city council, maybe even all of them, have less than 50% recognition by the voters. Mm -hmm. I remember in 1998, and then my numbers are off a little, that there was a posted a, a survey very early in the mayoral election in 1998. That's the first election Tony Williams 
won. And um, it, it, what was um, how, what was the um, voter identification of these different candidates? And it, the, I think it was like in the teens. It might have been a little higher than that. Voters don't know. When you ask, do you know who this person is? They don't know. And that means that they're not paying attention. Yeah. Uh, they don't know where, they, where we are on the issues. Um, people do begin to focus the closer you get to the election. And I've always been very aggressive as a candidate, getting around the entire city, making myself known. And I do that not just during the election so that when I'm out, um, you know, so that in an election when I see some folks, they don't say, well, this is the only time I've seen you. Um, no, I'm out all the time. And, and I'm not, um, I don't have to be defensive when somebody says they haven't seen me. So that's my style, to be aggressive, getting around to voters. And I recognize that voters don't focus on an election until the last couple of weeks. I mean, we're seeing that right now in Virginia, where with the governor's race, people are now beginning to focus the last couple of weeks on, on that, that race and making decisions. It's unfortunate, because in a democracy, you want people paying attention the entire time not just the last couple of weeks before the election. And in a democracy and during elections, you want an, edu an educated electorate. Yes. Washington, D.C. has gotten hit pretty hard about its educational, uh, the, the education that it provides its young kids. Yes. How are we going to make that better? It is getting better, and uh, it's getting better at a glacial speed. I'd like to see it get better a lot faster because the kids who are graduating from our schools who are not proficient in English and in math, are, we're losing them, and they're losing all the opportunities that they should have in, in life. Uh, so I, I'm anxious that we move quicker. How are we going to move quicker? Well, there are a number of strategies that are being pursued. And, uh, and implicit in my saying this is that I do support Chancellor Henderson, although I think the oversight that the council is giving is good because it keeps pushing her. Mm -hmm. um, she's focusing on improving reading in, um, in the uh, middle school because what we've seen is that there are a large number of kids who begin to drop out ninth grade, tenth grade. And um, so she's, to, to counteract that, she's now pushing literacy academies in the ninth grade. I've actually been pushing her to do it in the eighth grade. Uh, David Catani has legislation that would end social promotion. Uh, right now, a kid can be held back in the eighth grade, uh, I think in the sixth grade, but that's it. Um, no, the, a, a, and I, I agree, a kid should not be advanced from one grade to the next if he or she is not at grade level. A proficient in that, in that yes. grade. And yes. what has been the justification? I don't, you know, I for don't know. For moving a kid that's I, not proficient. I don't know. I mean, there are disadvantages to a kid that's held back. Uh, we all remember when we were in school, the kid who was repeating yeah. usually was not the kid that we all looked up to. Yeah. And um, we don't want to be stigmatizing kids, but the challenge is on the school and the teacher to get that kid ready. Now, that's another issue is that there are some kids, particularly kids who are coming from impoverished families, who have a lot of challenges that they bring into school. Uh, transportation being one. And uh, so we need to provide the resources, the additional resources to help those kids. And then sometimes I think that's an unfair burden on the public schools. Uh, that uh, I shouldn't emphasize public, but on the schools. I want a teacher who's teaching math or teaching reading, not a teacher who has to deal with all of the social problems that a kid might have. But we do have to, as a government, um, address the collateral problems that are holding kids back. Um, and that's an initiative I've been pushing, truancy reduction, looking at kids who are truant as self-identifying that there are issues in their lives mm -hmm. that are a reason why they are truant. Find out what those issues are and address them. It might be mental health. It could be transportation. It might be a single mom who... Um, is having difficulty getting the kid to school and getting to work and holding her job, uh, addressing these problems so that the kid can has one focus, and that is getting to school and wanting to be in school and learning. Is education the number one uh, problem in the District of Columbia right now? Yes, which is not to say that it's exclusive to others, but yes, I think education is for a variety of reasons. One is, the first and foremost, we shouldn't be losing kids. And when I say losing kids, I mean kids who are dropping out, kids who don't have all the opportunities that they should have when they graduate, if they graduate. 
Uh, so it's number one for that reason. It's number one because the city is less attractive to, for people to stay in or move to if our public education system isn't good. As someone who loves Washington, D.C. and identifies very closely, I'm angry that we're not further along the path towards statehood. Yeah. What are we doing? Where do you stand on that issue? Well, you know, I think uh, I support statehood, and uh, I, I'm just so frustrated with Congress. You know, they um, they won't give us more authority, yet at the same time, they know they're not interested in us. They seem to be only interested in D.C. when it's rider time, meaning time to put riders on something, and uh, or, you know, use us for their social arguments and national debates. And um, it, we need we need statehood. Um, the um, I I admire the efforts over the last several years, council members, the mayor who've gone out, ramped it up in terms of civil disobedience to try to bring more attention to the issue. I do think that the uh, federal sh government shutdown uh, helped us in bringing attention nationally to the fact that uh, you know why are we being treated like a federal agency? Our dollars are not federal dollars; they're local dollars, and, and that's not understood. Um, it's just not understood. You know, the mayor told a story. Remember that press conference he crashed? Yeah, and, Harry uh, Reid. He talked to a senator, not Harry Reid, but a different senator at that pre or after that press conference who, who spoke of the district as if our dollars were federal dollars <laughs> or like some of our, our local dollars we could still spend. Clearly not understanding our situation. We cannot spend local dollars until Congress says yes. It's ridiculous. You know, you pay your sales tax. I can't spend it until Congress says yes. That's not true anywhere else. And um, so, uh, but, but the challenge here... There's such an irony. It is such an irony. We're supposed to be the seat of democracy. Yes. That is a beacon light for the rest of the world. We're the only and nation's capital where the citizens don't have a vote in the national legislature. You know, that's an embarrassment. Yes. And that's an absolute indictment on Congress and on democracy. Yes. And we've tried legal solutions going to the courts, and I'm not saying we shouldn't continue to try that, but the courts have made it clear up to this point that it's a political solution. And the political solution involves Congress. And until we somehow get raise awareness outside of the District of Columbia and get pressure on these federal lawmakers from Utah and Wyoming and Montana and everywhere else, um, it's going to be a struggle. You know. At the beginning of the Obama administration, you had a Democratic president, you had a Democratic Congress, yes. and you had a Democratic Senate. Yes, wasted, Why in the hell wasn't more done then? Wasted uh, opportunity. I don't think we appreciated how tenuous that, uh, that moment was. And uh, we, did, we did not push. I, I don't think we pushed hard enough. Or, uh, and I don't want to be too critical because it's always clear in hindsight. I, I remember, though, that where we ended up with the voting rights, which was not statehood, but the voting rights bill, which was to give us a vote in, in the House, uh, we allowed it to get uh, attached to a gun rider. Let me ask you a question. Has Barack Obama proved to be in any way any better for Washington, D.C. than George Bush was? This will be my answer. I like Barack Obama. George Clinton, I mean, um, oh, come on, Bill Clinton. George Clinton. <laughs> but he was never in the White House. <laughs> and, Bill, and Bootsy and Neil. <laughs> Bill Clinton. When I have to have always George been. Clinton was just here, by the way. Oh, good. At the, at, at the D.C. Chamber of Commerce. Yes. Well, Maybe something else the, can the fall great off the wall. <laughs> um, Bill Clinton was much better. He was. And, um, but, you know, uh, that's just the challenge we've got to get to. Uh, oh, I'm coming back to that. Bill Clinton was much better. Yes. But in effect, I mean, and, and this is something that, you know, not necessarily I've thought about this so much before, but I'm just thinking about it right now in real terms because we keep it real on the Rock Newman show. Yeah. The reality is you as the chairperson of the D.C. City Council as a longtime political person really can't say that Barack Obama, in your measure of things, has been any better for Washington, D.C. Than, than George Bush was. Well, we, we've made this progress. We got the license plates put back on the presidential limousine. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you read my tone. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And you know, for a for a president who received over in the ninety percentile yeah. of the district's votes, that's a sad that's a sad commentary. But it also speaks to the challenge, and uh, and I, there's not an easy answer to it. But unfortunately, we're dependent on the national figures, members of Congress, the President of the United States. And, uh, you know, we've got a friend in the White House, and, uh, you know, he put budget autonomy in the Budget Request Act and in our appropriation bill, which has not passed. Uh, but we don't, uh, you know, we have locally passed budget autonomy, and as far as I'm concerned, it is the law. You but know, when I go to the mayor and to the uh, chief financial officer and say, okay, start writing the checks, we've got budget autonomy, yeah. they won't do it. Some people who I don't necessarily look so, so favorable upon, they said taxation without representation is tyranny always was and always will be. Taxation without representation right now is tyranny. Yes. I'd like to know if ever there is the discussion about a coordinated effort of greater civil disobedience. The courts are not giving any redress. The courts are not giving redress. The political process is not redress. Civil disobedience, should it be ratcheted up? I think so. Um, but, you know, that's easier said than done. And uh, we, we saw it in the discussion the, the um, discussion among elected officials during the government shutdown. Should we ratchet up the civil disobedience? And there are always reasons not to do it and arguments, you know, and, and maybe this will get us in trouble and so forth. You know, I'm reminded of in civil rights, the uh, Birmingham, the children marching in Birmingham in 1962. And uh, you don't, most people don't really look at that history. It, ha it was unbelievably controversial. And was it going to backfire? To get kids involved? Getting kids arrested? I mean, what would that make uh, Martin Luther King and SCLC look like? That they were getting kids involved. And yet it turned out to be a brilliant strategy. I mean, it just changed. It, it was, it was a, a significant moment in civil rights. That's always a challenge. One of the challenges with civil disobedience is uh, will it work or will it backfire? But I do think that we need to step that up. And the reason why is because it is a way that we can get more national attention. Part of the challenge with civil disobedience is that we have a demonstration and 50 people show up, 100 people show up, 600,000 people should show up. Yeah. And uh, how we get there, it, it's got to be thought through. And civil disobedience is never just on the cuff. It's got to be thought through. Phil Mendelson, you're invited back. Rock, Thanks thank a lot you. for coming on the Rock Newman yes. Show. Folks, we'll be right back after these brief messages. The Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. Rock Newman Show. Rock Newman Show.